NLP, is this something you've ever had to do? If you speak English and the other person speaks Chinese, you might be able to understand each other. In Chinese, the person is frantically gesturing for something, but you don't know what it is that they need. They make a lot of gestures, but you can't figure out what they mean. They shake their head when you offer them a phone. Someone says no when you offer them water. In no way does the other person like what you do, because they can't talk to you. After a while, the other person storms off without getting what he needed, and you are left wondering what it was that he needed in the first place. Think about having the same conversation, but this time you're both English and Chinese speakers. One half of you only talks in English, while the other desperately tries to talk in Chinese. There is no way for either side to communicate with the other, and both end up disjointed. These are the things that happen in your mind. Your conscious mind thinks in a certain way, but your unconscious mind thinks in a very different way. You may think you're setting up a life that will be happy and successful, but your unconscious mind hasn't been told about it yet. As a result, you find that your unconscious mind is always working against you. The way you feel doesn't match up with your goals. The way you move doesn't match. It doesn't matter that you know what you want because you keep running into problems after problems. It's important to keep in mind that your unconscious mind is not meant to be your enemy, not something that needs to be tamed or ruled over instead. It's something to use and work with. However, this means that you need to learn how to talk to it in the right way. There are ways to communicate with your unconscious part of yourself. If you can figure out how to do this, you can get it in line with your conscious desires and expectations. Make your dreams come true with it. Your unconscious isn't trying to get you or thwart your efforts to be happy. You don't know how to communicate with your unconscious mind in the best way to get what you want from it. Neuro-linguistic programming is a way to change the way your brain and language work. This is where neuro-linguistic programming comes in, and it can help. NLP is meant to help you get the results you want and need. It helps you figure out how to act in a way that will help you be successful. They say that if you can communicate your goals well, your unconscious mind will help you reach them. This is true if you can do this well. People who use NLP know that both their conscious and unconscious minds are very important and play important roles in their lives. NLP acts as a translator, ensuring that your conscious and unconscious minds work together rather than against each other. Working together increases the likelihood of achieving desired results because the two sides of your mind do not fight. By learning to communicate with the unconscious, Neuro-linguistic processing works. You're learning to communicate with your unconscious mind so you can finally tell it what you want. It helps you to communicate with yourself as well as with others. This means you can utilize NLP techniques to communicate with other people's unconscious thoughts. You may implant thoughts, influence behaviors, and change lives by learning to tap into others' unconscious brains. While this may sound exploitative, people do pay others to give them NLP. People will pay to overcome fears or bad behaviors. Interacting with an NLP expert can teach people to conquer emotions, develop new coping mechanisms, and more. Imagine having terrible anxiety because you went up to deliver something as a child but actually needed to go to the bathroom. You couldn't leave before the presentation, and then you had an accident. Everyone laughed at you, and you've been afraid of public speaking ever since. You couldn't bear the thought of speaking in front of a crowd. You failed many assignments in school because you refused to present. You would accomplish the task but not present it. Even though there are many of jobs that don't require public speaking, you may suffer if you choose one that requires it frequently. You know you aren't a kid anymore and won't be wetting yourself anytime soon, but you can't shake the feeling of being mocked and horrified. You may have sought help from an NLP expert. The practitioner would have numerous tools to assist you process and get past the trauma. You could learn to laugh at the event instead of being traumatized. You could learn to develop anchors that make you feel something else when you go up to present. Regardless of the method, there are various resources available to assist you heal. This is only one example of how NLP can help, but it can also be harmful. Narrators adore NLP techniques because they allow access to the unconscious. The manipulator can utilize NLP to generate mindless obedience, a tendency to give the manipulator exactly what they want. The manipulator can communicate with the unconscious mind without setting off the conscious mind's alarms. The manipulator can effectively bypass the awareness and tell the unconscious what to do, and the unconscious will do it. Without clear communication, the individual would be frustrated, wondering why they keep behaving the way they do. The NLP Keys To make NLP work, a few actions must be taken. These NLP Keys will help you learn how to access the mind. This is a quick outline of what needs to happen. There are strategies that use these phases almost exclusively and others that try to mix things up. But, at the core, 
these must occur. Examining and identifying beliefs, finding an appropriate anchor, and then placing that anchor efficiently are the three processes required to execute NLP. If you can master these three easy procedures, the more specific tactics will come naturally. You will be able to persuade others to do practically anything if you can get inside their heads. This is a method, but once you master it, you will have considerably more influence over yourself and others than you ever had before. You will master your own behavior while simultaneously having power and access to others to master theirs. These NLP tactics and strategies can help you win the long game. Examine ideas. First, you analyze the data. On begins to piece together how you or the other person feels about an event or scenario. You may find that the other individual is afraid of crowds and mingling. They tend to panic and melt down in front of a crowd. You know it and accept it. You will examine beliefs to discover why. In this scenario, it may be linked to that one occasion she wet herself in front of a crowd and was horrified every time she was in public. Use NLP on yourself, which is a valid approach that many people use to identify the emotion that you wish wasn't there. You may discover that you struggle to successfully connect with others when you are furious. Lack of communication frequently leads to issues in relationships. You will be able to pinpoint the problem as you identify your sentiments. Identifying them allows you to better target and destroy them. In NLP, this is done by using anchors, which are points intimately tied to an event or emotion. For example, you may habitually bite your nails when stressed, but the act of habitually chewing your nails might cause anxiety. Pick an anchor. It's time to figure out the anchors and emotions you can employ to tackle the difficulty. If you have a problem with anger, you might try to overcome it by provoking new feelings. Whenever you feel angry, you should trigger your anchor, which will cause you to feel something else. You are conditioning yourself. If you understand basic psychology, you are effectively teaching yourself to act a certain way in certain situations, allowing you to overcome the negative sentiments that have been holding you back. You can start reversing harmful emotional habits. You can learn to form new, healthier habits that lead to new, healthier behaviors. You can learn to shield yourself from bad feelings so you can heal and move on. Anything can be your new anchor. You could use a self-affirmation or word to help you stay calm. It could be a movement or action that you use to remind yourself to manage your anger, like snapping your wrist with a rubber band. It could be a safe smell. Even a particular thought or recollection might be comforting in times of sorrow. To maximize the impact of your anchor, make sure you can regularly access it. You may be better served by a short statement or hand motion. You can do that subtly and at any time. Set a sail. Finally, you must learn to anchor. This is where your actions and techniques deviate the most. There are various ways to set a good anchor point for yourself or others, and which method you select will depend on your goals and circumstances. Visualization is useful when working with someone who knows what you're doing. If you wish to go unnoticed, you can utilize mirroring, subtle mimicking, and emotional triggers. If you want to shift your own way of thinking and emotional reaction, you might consciously reframing a memory from bad to humorous. In the end, the method you choose will depend on who you are trying to persuade and how you want to approach it. You can use a mirroring connection to persuade a stranger to buy something you want them to buy. From then, you may subtly convince him to nod his head by nodding your own head, making the other person's thinking considerably more likely to be agreeable and influencing them to nod along with you without their realizing it. You want an anchor that is basic and easy to build, but not so popular that strangers randomly trigger it throughout the day. While you could undoubtedly cause someone to create a certain expression every time you give a thumbs up, it would be neither kind nor ethical. You would be distracting and problematically triggering the other individual, because no one wants to be glared at every time they thumbs up another. It's all about body language. We use body language when we communicate with each other to make sure that we understand each other. Scholars say that these nonverbal signals are a big part of everyday communication. The things we don't say can still pass on a lot of information to our bodies through our body language and our actions. Also, it has been said that body language can make up between 60% and 65% of all communication. It is important to understand body language. But it is also important to pay attention to other signals, such as what they mean. Rather than relying on a single event, you need to look at signals as a band instead. When you learn and master how to use body language for effective communication, you will also be able to manipulate people's minds in a good way. There are many different types of body language. Even if they don't say anything, the majority of people still don't know what they think and feel. Nonverbal communication refers to signals that aren't words, like the shape of the sender's body their physical appearance, 
their voice inflections and the intensity of their voice, and other signs. A lot of people don't think about how they communicate with each other non-verbally, but how they show it and how they interact with others could be very important. It's a small group, many expressions, short expressions of feelings that the person tries to hide, hand gestures, and the recording of posture in the human mind very quickly even if the person isn't aware of them. In the long run, these acknowledgement snapshots can have an impact on how an individual interprets the inspiration, disposition, and receptivity of other people as well as how they see their own inner identity. Even if they are short, certain mental health issues, such as neuropsychiatric issues like mental defect, may make it even more difficult for people who can't speak or read body language to recognize and respond to the messages. Different Types of Body Language There are different types of body language. This is because we can't put all of the different styles into the same group. Different body languages can be seen. How can body language styles be different? Most of the time, body language is divided into two columns. That includes the parts of the body and the goal. What kinds of each class can be seen? Let's start with body parts and the language they use. In this case, the head refers to where the head is and how it moves, such as back and forth, right to left, and side to side. Also, the shake of the hair. Face, this includes facial expressions, as well. You should know that the face has a lot of muscles that move different parts of the face. These muscles range from 54 to 98. The way your face moves tells people what's going on inside your head. Move up and down, as well as make a frown. The eyebrows can show how they feel by moving. Eyes can be rolled, move up and down, right and left, blink, and widen. The flaring of the nostrils and the formation of wrinkles at the top of the nose can show how the nose is being shown. Lips have many jobs, like snarling and smiling. They can also be open or closed and tight or puckering. The tongue can roll in and out, go up and down, touch while kissing, and lick the lips. It can also move up and down, open and close your jaw, clench your jaw, and move your lower jaw to the right and left. Your body posture. This is how you put your body, legs, and arms together, and how it looks to other people. This is called the body proximity. It looks at how close your body is to other people, and how close you are to them. They move up and down, hunch, and hang down. As you move your arm, it goes up and down, straight and crossed. Legs and feet can show a lot of different things. There are a lot of ways you can put your legs together. They can be straight, crossed, or put one on top of the other. They can face the next person you are talking to, or they can face away from each other. There are two parts of your body that can help you read the way people move their hands and fingers. It's possible for the hands to move up and down, but only people in the same group can understand them. How someone handles and places things isn't thought of as a body part, but it does play a role in reading body language. This could be a sign of anger, happiness, and more. This includes making body movements, or gestures that you want to make. These are the things you want to do, like shake your hands, blink your eyes, move, shake your body in a sexy way, and more. Besides voluntary moves, there are also involuntary ones. These are moves that you can't stop. The things that can happen are sweating, laughing, crying, and a lot of other things as well. Body language is very important. Most people use social networks and texts to connect in the modern digital age, and this is a very safe way to do so. When you use digital communication, you can speak at your own convenience, but you can also lose important nonverbal signs, like vocal inflections, because you can't recognize the person when you speak to them. There is a good chance that body language will keep getting better to meet the needs of people all over the world who use digital communication. Many times, you'll hear about the bad things that happen when you use body language. Some people say not to twist in a certain way or to sit in a certain way. As a result, Body language can help you live a better life. Let's look at what you should do to improve your body language. How body language can affect how effectively people can talk. We may think and hope that communication is as simple as the words we say. But that isn't true. Our message is heard more than just our words. This is true if you've ever made a mistake in a text or email. Words alone won't do. It is important to pay attention to your body language because it can help or hurt your message and presentation. People may see us face to face or through a video camera. You might find that body language helps the person who gets information read your mind and understand your thoughts. It's important to know that there's more to the message you're sending than just the message itself. There's the meta message of who you are and the reason you want to send that message, too. Body language is always telling your audience something. As you read this, 
I want to give you some specific advice that will help you communicate better with your body language and help you get your message across. Always look at each other. It's the first thing on the list, without a doubt. You will be surprised to learn that our eyes speak for us more than our words do. However, there are some cultural differences that could make this hard to work out. When we look at each other, we become more confident in what we say and believe that the other person is trustworthy. Our eyes may be the doors to our soul, but they are also a way to build a relationship and communicate effectively. You might say that you are shy and can't look someone in the eye all the time. The shyness might make you look down or sideways when you're talking to someone, so that might be why. Your audience may think that you don't believe in your message. I think you should work on keeping your eyes open. People can learn body language over time. Purpose to build up the skills one by one. Walk with energy. Think about the first time you meet someone. They come to you in a slow way, walking slowly towards you. The same thing. But this time, imagine someone walking with purpose and power. We're not thinking about running, but a deliberate walk. There's no doubt that this is what the person thinks, is there. Our walking style sends out a message of trust and honesty, as well as a sense of both beauty and grace. When you walk with confidence, you show that you know what you're doing and that you believe in yourself, too. You already know what will happen next. People will be able to believe in you, too. It's time to bring out your reflection. Our feelings and thoughts show up in our nonverbal communication, which is the point of this article. When you need to communicate better with others, think about how their body language might be reflected in your own words. This isn't a picture of an infant imitating another person on YouTube. The point isn't to copy or make fun of someone, but to show sympathy through your body language. This must be done in a way that doesn't draw attention to itself but it can help others understand your messages better. Do this, let people see their hands. As a group, we use our hands to send a message. You can even watch people on the phone, even though the other person can't see them at all. They use their hands to show what they think is important. When people can't see our hands, they wonder if we're hiding something, if we're stressed, and maybe a lot of other things. Your hands are an important part of your effective communication. So use them and keep them out of the way of people who don't want to see them. Empowering nonverbal communication can help you. Two quick examples. Eye-to-eye -eye connection and gesturing with people to show that you understand and also agree. As soon as someone does this, the message is clear to you, right? This isn't the main thing. In the same way as reflecting over, this is using our body language and movements to show people that we pay attention to them and want to learn from them as well. Speed up. A few of us speed up the way we talk. Slowing down is a good idea, but it can slow down your signals and growth. There's a very small difference that we cross that makes our body language show tension, apprehension, or even contempt. Some speed conveys vitality. Make sure you take a full breath and let go a little. I want to have an amazing handshake. If you have one, you know how important this is. If you don't know this, you might have a limp, dead fish, or a handshake that is too strong and overpowering. A handshake tells people a lot about who you are by telling them what you look like. Work on a strong and welcoming handshake, and you will make other people more likely to believe and trust you. We can and should deal with these things as a group, but don't forget that the person who is getting our message and watching our nonverbal communication is the judge. The way they see our nonverbal communication is the most important thing in the world to them right now. But if we use these ideas, we'll make it more likely they'll be true and we'll be able to have better relationships and connect better. This is a list of even more powerful tips and how they can help you communicate better. To boost your self-esteem, do the power pose. Research shows that if you hold your body in wide, high-powered poses like leaning back with your arms behind your feet and your head up on your chair, or standing with your arms and legs wide open for as little as two minutes, you'll have more testosterone, a hormone linked to dominance and power. You should do this if you start to feel nervous but want to look more confident at the same time. Such positions. In addition to causing hormonal changes in both men and women, also make people more dominant and more afraid of risk. Act like you're listening to encourage people to join in. If you want your audience to do something, don't do other things while they're doing it. Do not check your text messages, look at the time, or see how other people respond to your text messages while you are at school. By moving your head and body to face them directly, you can pay attention to the people who are talking. Another way to show your commitment and attention through body language is to lean forward, nod, and rotate your head. Hearing people is very important. It's just as important to make sure they know how much you care. Try to remove obstacles so you can make a connection. Remove anything that blocks your vision or makes it hard for you and the rest of the group to work together. Breathe. But be aware that by holding your teacup in a way that seems to shield your body, 
or separate you from everyone else. You can make a barrier. When a senior manager saw how high people kept their coffee cups, he could figure out how happy his employees were. To figure out how nervous people are, they tend to hold their coffee cups high up in the air. People who held their hands at waist level were more relaxed than those who held their hands above their chest. Connect by shaking hands. When you touch someone, you're giving them a signal that you care about them. As little as a few seconds of touching someone on the arm, side, or shoulder makes a human connection inside. When you look at the workplace, through the handshake tradition, physical touch and comfort are built up and this tactile contact makes you feel good for a long time. You are twice as likely to remember people if you shake their hands. People are more friendly and open when they meet people and shake hands. Smile to make people feel good. Putting on a real smile doesn't just make you feel better, but it also lets people know that you're open, supportive, and reliable. Slowly, a real smile comes out, crinkles the eyes, widens the lips, and shines up the face. It then slowly fades away as the person smiles. A smile has a big impact on how people see and treat you. There's a good chance that when you smile at someone, they smile back at you. People's facial expressions can make them feel even more happy when they smile. You smile back, and when the other person smiles back, it changes their emotional state in a way that makes them feel better about themselves after the smile. When you agree, always show it through your words and your posture. People who work with you or our clients say how much they like or agree with you by mimicking your body language without realizing it. It can be very important to build relationships and share feelings when you mirror other people with a goal. The first step in mirroring is to look at the gestures on a person's face and body, and then let your body move in a way that mirrors them. The other person will be appreciative and feel welcome to do so, which will make them happy. If you want to know the truth, always pay attention to people's feet and look at their clothes. As people try to control how their body looks, they pay most attention to facial expressions, postures of the body, and movements of the hand, arm. Because the feet and legs haven't been practiced, they are where all the truth can be found. People who move their feet more will often show signs of anxiety and discomfort when they are under any kind of stress. The feet will always play around the seat. Spread and curl your feet to relieve stress. You can even make them jump out of the way when you want to flee. Watchers are better at figuring out how someone is feeling when they can see their whole body. We don't know for sure but we've been reacting to people who move their feet all our lives. Keep your voice down to show authority. Make or receive a call or give a speech when your voice is at its best pitch. Put your lips together and make the sounds of um, um hum. Make sure your voice doesn't go so high at the end of each sentence. It could be mistaken for asking questions or trying to get people to like you. If you want to make an opinion, use the authoritative pitch which starts with a low note and raises the voice through the rest of the sentence. The voice goes down at the end of the sentence. When you do this, you will be able to take charge and be in charge of each space. Don't cross your legs. You will improve your memory if you don't. According to a study, people who open their legs and arms in a lecture room had better memories than those who crossed them. So, to help you remember more, you should open your arms and legs. If you are giving a presentation and notice that your audience has these traits, Change your strategy and do something that will help them listen better. Taking a break and making sure you see a change could help you. Persuasion that happens in the background. Subliminal persuasion is a way to get someone to do something without them even knowing. There isn't going to be any way for the victim to know that you are trying to get them to do what you want. It is one of the ways manipulators and others can get people to do what they want them to do. They use words and gestures to get people to do what they want them to do. Because of this, things like smiling, moving the head, and more are used both positive and negative ways, so you might see them. It is a powerful, but sometimes difficult, way to get someone to do what you want them to do. It uses words, but also body language and the meaning behind the words, to get the person you want to manipulate to do what you want them to do. Techniques used for subliminal persuasion can be very powerful weapons in today's world. They can help you get ahead very quickly. In a market where there is a lot of competition and you need to stay ahead of the game, these skills can be very useful. They say that subliminal advertising is more effective than traditional advertising because it doesn't make people think about what they're seeing. As they say, persuasion that looks like persuasion isn't any more persuasive now. If you are a manipulator, you can use this information to help you take control of the person. If they use too much persuasion, the victim will just walk away. The more obvious signs that someone is trying to get you to buy or do something are so common that it's easy to avoid them if you don't want to. There is no point in manipulating someone if they try to get them to buy something with a big sales pitch and flashing lights. As long as the victim is smart, 
they will be able to see these signs and get away from the manipulator. This is where subliminal persuasion can come in. People who manipulate people will be very careful about the nonverbal signs that they send out when they talk to them. People who manipulate people will use body language and other nonverbal signs to try to get people to do what they want them to do. Using subliminal persuasion is going to be based on how people feel. This means that there is going to be some kind of subconscious part to this kind of persuasion. As a manipulator or someone else who needs to use persuasion, you will make the person you want to get to do something feel excited and comfortable about it. They will be sent to the subconscious mind. Then, you have to take them to the logical mind as well, so that you can figure out what is going on. You can then talk to this part of your mind by talking about the rational things that make the choice a good one. Some things that aren't visible will play a role in whether the manipulator is going to be believable. For example, how the manipulator dresses is going to play a role in how the game is going to work out. When someone manipulates another person, he or she will make sure that the person sees the person at their best. People who manipulate people will always look like they're doing well. They will dress well, keep their appearance clean, and always act like they're doing well. In spite of what the manipulators say about being hurt or ill, your manipulator will still look good. The way you are wired makes you more likely to help someone with a good look than someone who isn't. If the manipulator wants to take advantage of this, they are going to take extra care with their looks. There can also be a level of subliminal persuasion in the language used by the manipulator when they ask for a favor. It's not what you say, but how you say it. The manipulator isn't going to say anything that is too crazy, because this might make their victim think they don't trust them. It will, however, make a difference how they use their words. This usually leads to them getting what they want. People's inflections and intonations will also play a big role in how what they say means. People may think that I can't promise you that price means only one thing. People who manipulate people or sell things may use this word in different ways. You can see some of them below. I can't promise you that price, though. This one will say that the manipulator isn't willing to get you that price, but they might promise that price to someone else. I can't promise you that price, though. A person might not be able to do it, but there might be someone else who can. I can't give you that price. This one will say that there is no way that the person will get that price. I can't say I'll give you that price. I can't promise you that price. That person is going to see what they can do with this. They might not be able to give you what you want, but they could still get you something good. The price I can't promise you. Even if the price doesn't fall in the right place, they can still promise you something. These statements are a great way to use the ideas of subliminal persuasion because they are important depending on which words are chosen by the manipulator or anyone else. So many different meanings can be made out of the same words. And it can be so subtle that you can hear a sentence and figure out what it means without even realizing what is going on. When you say a certain sentence, think about the intonation that you can use when you say it. Then, think about how manipulators could use those words as well. In fact, there are about three options when it comes to intonation and how it can change the meaning of a whole sentence. And there are a lot of them. There are three ways to end a sentence. There are three types of intonations. One that goes up, one that goes down, which means the intonation is deeper a voice intonation that doesn't change at all. Advertising with subliminal persuasion. A part of subliminal persuasion called subliminal advertising should be on your list of things to look into with this subject. This type of advertising tries to get you to think bad things about another company in order to make money for them. You will be able to feel, think, and feel different things when you eat things from the business. They hope that you will want to buy more of the same things. A lot of people in some countries don't like the idea of subliminal advertising because they think it's a bad way to get people to buy things. However, it is very common for an advertiser to be able to get into the head of the customer. And most of these advertisers are very good at it. They may even pay people to watch the commercial so that they can see how their brains work while they are watching it. They can then make changes to the advertisement to make it even better. The advertisers are going to keep an eye on a lot of things. In this case, they might decide to track eye movement to see which part of the commercial is getting the crowd's attention the most. They can then use this information to sell a product and be as effective with subliminal persuasion as possible, which is what the advertising company does. Advertisements can be very powerful. They can get into your brains and figure out how to sell you something better than you know what capitalism is or what it means to be a customer. It might be fun to think about a chocolate commercial as an example. The ad could show a picture of a peanut butter cup. When you look at the screen, you see the logo for a split second. Then there is nothing else that tells you to buy that food. However, this is enough to tell you about the candy bar, and the idea of it stays in your head for a while. 
This can make it more likely that you'll buy the same treatment when you go to the store again. Subliminal persuasion, of course, doesn't always work. We don't always agree with what we see in ads. You see a lot of ads during the week, but you don't go out and buy a lot of different things. But it is very good. Think about why you buy some of the things you own. Think about why you have so much stuff around the house that you never use. If you use subliminal advertising and persuasion, you could be to blame for this. The following are some different ways of being subliminally persuaded. In either case, it is very likely that subliminally you have been convinced in some way or another to agree with the idea. If someone has ever used passive-aggressive behavior on you, then they have also tried to use this kind of persuasion on you. Mom, for example. Your mom might say something about how she saw someone at the store that she hadn't seen in a long time. And then she makes a comment about how heavy that person was in a certain tone. The reason the mother did this could be a hidden message about how that mother feels about her daughter's weight. Because of this, the persuasion is that the daughter's view of the world is going to be changed. Even though the daughter may not be meeting the standards of beauty that her mother has, she may still be beautiful. In response, the daughter might try to change her life. She might stay away from her mother to avoid these comments and not feel bad, or she might work and lose weight if possible. This is one of the trickiest ways to get people to do what you want them to do. It's one of the most difficult to fight off. This kind of persuasion often leads people to believe in things that no one else does, and they can't come back from that. If someone is manipulating someone, they will not admit it. The victim will either have to leave or stay in a cycle that they can't break, trying to get more of something. One way someone who is a subliminal persuader gets what they want from other people is to start out by asking for more than they need in the end. Perhaps that person needs $5,000, but they know that's a lot of money to ask for right away. That's why they're going to ask for a much bigger amount instead. When someone asks for less money, they do this to kind of shock the victim into thinking the lower amount is more reasonable, and they are more likely to agree. When this conversation is over, the person who was persuaded subliminally may feel bad because they didn't give more money or help out for the full amount. It doesn't matter that the person already asked for something. The manipulator can keep coming back because their victim will think that they didn't give enough the first time around. Or, because they helped in the past, they may feel like they have to keep up this pattern and help again. People who help each other. In the beginning, a person who wants someone to do a good deed may ask for a favor. As with manipulation. It's more like a demand or a very clear telling of what the victim needs to do. But the persuader will ask for the favor in a way that makes it look like they need help or aid from the victim. The victim is going to think that they should help because they may have a need to care for other people. And they may feel good about themselves for doing a good deed for someone. They may do a favor for the other person first. They feel like they need to pay back the manipulator because the person helped them first. This makes them feel like they owe them money. However, with subliminal persuasion, the manipulator is just going to get right to the point and focus on making it look like they need help with some kind of thing. They may think they are special because they get to help this other person out, which makes them feel like they are important. They might feel good about themselves because they were able to help someone else, which makes them feel important. Even though the victim will feel good about doing the favor, the manipulator will get what they want from the victim, even though the victim will feel good about doing it. Being praised is a good thing. There are times when flattery can help with this, but when the manipulator gets to work, it can be used against the person being tricked. This is what the manipulator thinks. They think that if they can make their victim feel good about themselves and build them up, then they can get what they want from that person. When you watch young people use flattery, you can see how well it works and how well it works. Often, kids learn how to use flattery at a young age in order to get people to do what they want. They already know that using their charm can make other people happy which will make them want to do things for the person manipulating them. This can happen in abuse, too. After a while, when it works for them, the abuser will start to build up their significant other a lot. They will then start to tear this person down and be in charge of the situation all over again. If the manipulator is being praised, people will be more willing to do something for him or her. If someone tells us we look good, even if it's just for show or from someone we don't know well, we feel good. It makes us feel smarter, prettier, stronger, and more like us because it does all of these things. When to ask for something, to use subliminal persuasion, those who are going to do so will make sure that they figure out the right time to ask for something. For them, they won't just think about who to go after. They will also try to figure out when to ask the victim to help with the favor so that the answer will be yes. When the manipulator wants to ask you for a favor, there are many ways for them to do it. But it won't happen when you're at your best. During good times, 
They won't be asking. They won't ask if you are having a good day, if you are well rested, happy, or ready to think through your answers to them. This is when normal people would ask because they want you to give them a good answer. But keep in mind that the manipulator wants to get the answer that is best for them. They also know that if you pay attention to what they are asking for, you will most likely say no. Make sure not to ask for favors or help when you're tired, even if you're in a good mood. This is why. It will take the manipulator some time to find these times and then use them when they ask you for help. When both of you are in public places, someone who is trying to get you to do something will also try to get you to do something for them. They think this is going to give them the upper hand in the situation, and they are right. They like to do this because it can stop them from having a confrontation that is going to be uncomfortable and not good for them. People may not be able to tell when this kind of persuasion is going on in some cases. They will feel good about themselves when they can help. They can figure out what the other person needs and then offer to help in some way. They can feel good about themselves, and they can sometimes look good in front of the people who are important to them. The manipulator gets what they wanted because the victim did what they were told to do. Psychology that is dark is called dark psychology. Dark psychology is a type of psychology that deals with the dark side of things. Having knowledge is the most important thing about being a human being. One of the main reasons why we evolved from primates and became what we are today is because our minds changed. The human mind, on the other hand, is a lot more difficult to understand. Even though we know a lot about the human brain and have a lot of high-tech tools, scientists are still having a hard time understanding the abilities of the human brain. In the same way, I can say that someone who knows a lot about human psychology is a lot more powerful than the rest of us psychology can be used in every part of life. A lot of people prey on each other because there are fewer resources in our time and more people in our world. Dark psychology is nothing more than the study of how people are naturally drawn to each other and how they try to get their own way. People can take advantage of you even if they don't tell you, even if they have a plan in mind. A lot of people don't do this, and it doesn't need to be explained. With our health, we try to take advantage of people even if they are close to us without even thinking about what they will go through. Some people hide their thoughts and train their brains to make them go away, but some people act on the impulse of these thoughts. This is how the human mind is set up. While most of the time, there is always a reason and a reason why people do things that will have an effect on someone and there is a reason and a reason why they do that. There are also people who have the tendency to prey on other people without having any goal, motivation, or plan. In dark psychology, we look into why people do what they do and we try to figure out the thoughts, processes, and ideas that make people go out of their way to be predatory. The value of dark psychology. It is important to know what is going on inside a person's brain to make them want to take advantage of other people's mentality. But getting psychological knowledge about someone is itself a very hard thing to do. Someone who knows a lot about dark psychology is more important than anyone can think of at first. The human brain is full of a lot of different ideas. If we sleep, our brain doesn't stop making new ideas. This shows how beautiful our brain is. If you want to get rid of the useless thoughts from the useful ones, you'll have to be a psychologist to do that job. Dark psychology is at work in the world right now. You might not like it when I say that. It's true that you can't change this. A person who knows what dark psychology is all about has a lot more advantages than people who don't know what it is. While it's true that most people don't even bother to learn the basics of psychology and don't know about dark psychology, it's hard to find a man who knows about it. Ideas and principles that can help us grow in every area of our lives can be found in dark psychology ideas and principles. Having some knowledge of dark psychology can help you in both your professional and personal lives. You don't need to become a psychopath to do that. All you need is common sense and a little curiosity to learn about dark psychology and how it can help you get what you want. You don't need to know dark psychology as a way to protect yourself because it covers a lot of things in life that don't just protect you. These are the four dark psychology traits. Narcissism. Narcissism is the dark trait that people who are narcissists show. Narcissists have a lot of grandiosity, superiority, dominance, and entitlement. Neat people who have a positive outlook are good at fooling other people because they are easy to talk to. If you want to build your own ego, you should look for people who can feed into your narcissistic supply say psychologists. They also don't have a good sense of how to treat people. It is one of the main things you notice about narcissists. They are good at building and nurturing relationships, and they can make it seem like their actions aren't selfish at first. We all have some narcissistic traits, but only a very small number of us have narcissistic personality disorder, 
which makes us very selfish. There is a character in Greek mythology named Narcissus who is the source of the words narcissist and narcissism. Narcissus was a hunter and a young man who looked very good. This is how the story goes. In fact, everyone seemed to fall in love with him. People were treated with contempt and disdain by him, and he didn't show them the love that they gave him back, even though he was loved. Then, Nemesis, the goddess of revenge, cursed him to fall in love with his reflection in a pool of water because he did this. Just like Narcissus, modern narcissists have a crush on their own selves. It turns out that narcissistic people don't like the real versions of themselves. They like the perfect versions of themselves that they only see in their minds. It's easy to think that narcissists have a lot of self-esteem, but that isn't true. They have a perverted kind of self-esteem that isn't based on loving or accepting who they are but on loving a fictitious grandiose version of themselves. When a narcissist does something that hurts someone else, it's usually because he wants to achieve that grand vision of himself, even though he knows for sure that it's not real. Narcissists think they are more important than they are. They think they should be treated better than everyone else. Their sense of entitlement is way too high. They believe that when they get good treatment in certain situations, it's for the good of everyone else. They believe that when they take advantage of you, they're actually giving them something to be grateful for. This way, he can justify a lot of selfish and bad things that he has done in the past. They think that they are more important and deserve more than the other person does. A narcissist thinks that he is more talented than his co-workers, so he should be in charge of projects or be promoted before everyone else. In order to make themselves seem more special, narcissists surround themselves with people who are more likely to be nice. They want to be around people who will make them feel like they are worth more than they are. When you spend time with narcissists, even the most agreeable people can see flaws in other people. After a while, they won't say good things about the narcissist's bad actions anymore. Nephilims try to control the thoughts and actions of the people around them in order not to do this. Narcissists are very strict. They can control people in both covert and overt ways so they can get what they want. Because they want to keep getting narcissistic supply, they try to manipulate others so they can keep getting what they need. When people try to break free from their control, they can get angry or rage. Nephilims are more likely to abuse their partners because they want to keep the other person under their control. Narcissists are more likely to be mean at work because they want to punish people for challenging their power. When we get to the end of the video, we'll talk about how to deal with narcissistic people. Machiavellianism Machiavellianism is a dark trait that is full of deception and manipulation. Machiavellians tend to be very cynical people. This isn't because they are skeptical or have doubtful curiosity. They just don't care about the moral rules that other people follow. They tend to be selfish and not moral. They don't have a sense of right and wrong. They'll do anything as long as it helps them. Machiavellians are cold and unprincipled, and they are very good at manipulating people. Life is a zero-sum game, and the only way to get ahead is by manipulating other people. They say, when they want something in a given situation, the end always justifies the means to get there. This is how they think about all kinds of relationships. He was an Italian political philosopher who wrote The Prince. Machiavellianism is named after him. How to control the masses and manipulate people to gain power over them is given in the book, which is called The Art of War. To be clever and manipulative as long as you get what you want from the book. It says that in order to achieve one's goals, it's morally acceptable to hurt other people. In this way, Machiavellianism and narcissism are both similar. In both traits, there is an underlying belief that one's own interests serve the common good, even if other people are hurt. People who have these traits are more likely to cheat, lie, and harm other people in order to get what they want. It may be hard to tell if you're in love with them because they don't care about anyone else. They won't be afraid to hurt other people if it's in their best interest. Machiavellians, on the other hand, may harm others for their own pleasure, because they don't have empathy or because they need to meet certain emotional needs. They don't give a second thought to the emotional damage they leave behind. In fact, they only care about other people's feelings if they know it will come back to haunt them. Some psychologists and anthropologists have said that Machiavellianism could be an evolutionary advantage and that it's a good thing to have. Machiavellians know how people feel, which helps them deal with both real and perceived threats. They can, however, avoid empathy when reacting to threats which makes their actions more effective. People who are Machiavellians are more likely to be successful if the rule of the jungle. Survival of the fittest is true, because we're not living in the jungle anymore. This argument doesn't make sense. Society can only work if everyone cares about the well-being of other people. A Machiavellian is a master manipulator, 
and they are very likely to be caught up in white-collar crimes. With this trait, people who do embezzlement schemes, pyramid schemes, stock swindling schemes, overpricing schemes, and political crimes are more likely to do them. In business or politics, they manipulate people to get to the top. When they get there, they use the same techniques to manipulate the masses. Psychopathy Psychopathy is the most evil of all of the dark traits, and it is the only one. Psychopaths don't have a lot of empathy, so they don't care about other people. On the other hand, they have a lot of impulsiveness and are thrill-seeking people. They are very callous, very manipulative, and have a strong sense of grandeur. They don't care about the harm they do to other people when they seek thrills. We don't know as much about psychopaths as we thought we did before. They try to keep their appearances normal, even though they don't have empathy or a conscience. They learn how to act normally by watching how others feel. Charming people can even be used to get what they want from you. They can be dangerous, but this isn't always the case. They can be volatile, but this isn't always the case. A lot of people are interested in psychopaths, which is why you see so many of them in pop culture. However, with excitement comes a lot of false ideas. This can be dangerous because it can make us forget that most psychopaths are normal, at least on the surface. They can still hurt us in other ways, even if they don't appear to be psychopaths. People who start fights, don't pay attention to your feelings, and always lie to you may be psychopaths. Adult psychopathy can't be cured. There are programs for children and young people who show signs of psychopathic tendencies. These programs teach them to be less callous and more considerate of other people. You need to know the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath to be able to understand what they are like. In everyday conversation, these words are often used together. But in psychology, they have very different meanings, so don't use them the same way. A sociopath is someone who isn't nice to other people. If a person has a bad childhood, he might become a sociopath because he doesn't trust society or because he has psychological problems that came from the bad upbringing. On the other hand, psychopathic traits are built into us. People don't become psychopaths. They are born psychopaths and they don't change. However, social and environmental factors may play a role in a person's unique brand of psychopathy. As an example, people who are born with psychopathic traits and who are brought up in a chaotic and violent environment are more likely to show more of their psychopathy than people who are not born with these traits. The three main causes of psychopathy are genetics, brain anatomy, and the way people live their lives. Psychopathy is on a scale like the other dark traits. Clinicians use a scale to measure the level of psychopathy. Everyone falls somewhere on the scale. But people with a score of 30 and above are considered to have psychopathy that is of clinical significance. If you think someone you're dealing with is a psychopath, you can find the Hair Psychopathy Checklist online and use it for free as a guide if you want to be sure that you're dealing with a psychopath. Sadism Sadism, like the other three dark traits, is marked by being cruel. A lot of people who are sadists aren't really that bad at being impulsive or manipulative. This is why this trait wasn't originally part of what is now called the dark triad. Sadists are people who like to be mean to other people. All the signs point to everyday sadists being normal and functional, but they enjoy hurting people, so they do it all the time. They are called everyday sadists because they are different from narcissists, Machiavellians, and other dark people who may have sadism as one of their dark traits. Sadists are naturally drawn to hurt people, even if they are completely innocent. Sadists can sometimes put the pain of others above their own feelings, even if it costs them. They find cruelty to be fun and exciting, and some even find it sexually stimulating. This is what they think. They say that sadists are drawn to jobs where they can hurt other people while pretending it's for a good reason. There are likely to be a lot of people who want to work for law enforcement or the military because of this. If you compare the levels of sadism in police forces to how sad people are in general and compare them, the levels inside police departments are always higher. If this is the case, it might be why some police officers have trouble with taking the law into their own hands. Sadists often hurt people around them for no reason, and when they find out that the person in question isn't likely to fight back, they're more likely to get angry. Those who don't stand up to bullies are the ones who get picked on all the time. When someone is a sadist, he or she would tell your secrets to other people even if they had agreed to keep them private. This is because sadists like when you are hurt. They are also more likely to portray others in false or unflattering terms with the goal of hurting the other person's reputation. Machiavellians may do this to help their own cause, but sadists would do this because it's fun for them. Sadists may also try to get you fired from your job or make your success less likely, 
but not because they want to get ahead of you. They just want you to be unhappy. They may also try to break up your personal relationships. They'll start fights in your relationship, then sit back and enjoy the drama and pain. Not because they need it, but because they don't want someone else to have it. They are more likely to bully you both in real life and on the web. You can always tell if someone is a sadist by the comments and remarks he makes on the web. Most internet trolls are sadists who live their lives in a way that makes them angry all the time. They will say negative things about almost anything, not because they are very sure of their own opinions, but because they want to bother you or make you angry. When they talk about things online, they'll always find something bad to say about them. They become more excited when you talk to them. They'll also be more likely to bother you on the internet if you talk to them a lot. It is possible to use mind control methods. Some words that are similar to mind control are brainwashing, thought reform, manipulation, exploitive persuasion, sociopsychological manipulation, behavioral change technology, and a few other words that describe the same thing. As we said before, there are both good and bad reasons for mind control, but we tend to only see the bad things. If you want to manipulate something, there are a lot of different ways. Here, we'll talk about two of them. The sociopsychological manipulator is the first person you need to look out for. This is someone who tries to use social pressure to get someone to do something different or make a decision they don't want to do or say. This can be indirect and deceitful at the same time. This can also be very direct. With this type of manipulation, there is often a lot of stress put on the people who are being targeted. It's one example, but there are bigger ones that we don't even think about. There are many ways to manipulate people's minds, but one of the best is marketing. We don't think of marketing in this way, and it isn't usually bad in any way. In some cases, negative political ads don't fall under this rule at all. However, marketing is just big-scale persuasion, but that's what it is. Let's look at TV commercials. They are. What are they? A few years ago, there were ads for cigarettes on the TV and in the newspaper. Most people who have a few years under their belt will remember the Marlboro Man, but not everyone will. He was a healthy cowboy who looked tough. A lot of the time, he was riding his horse and smoking. These commercials didn't show anyone who was sick and couldn't breathe. There were also a lot of tobacco ads with very attractive people, both men and women, who were holding lit cigarettes in the ads as well. In reality, people who smoked for a long time didn't look like the people shown on TV or in the ads. What about the commercials that try to make us think that if we buy a certain product, our lives will be better right away? Buy this drink and you will always be happy. I like the ads for medicines. Are you sad and depressed? Talk to your doctor about blah medicine and say goodbye to sadness. No one talks about what might be causing this sadness or how the best way to treat it would be to stop what might be causing it, if possible, and not just take medicine for it. They might even show pictures of cute puppies or kids who are having a lot of fun. They have linked their product to something that makes you happy and peaceful, which makes you think that way, too. This is the best manipulation I've ever seen, by far. Ads for fast food. In order to be healthy, most people need to eat well. If you only eat these things that have been proven to be bad for you in small amounts, it might not be a bad thing. Have you ever seen a fast food ad with a fat person? People try to manipulate us psychologically when we are teenagers, in high school, from all sides. We had to deal with the ads we saw on TV and in magazines. We had to learn how to grow up and listen to our parents. Then there was the dreaded bombardment of peer pressure, which is always a bad thing. I'm sure that everyone knows this. Peer pressure is just the culmination of a lot of different kinds of social manipulation. A person gets ideas from outside sources and then passes them on to other people. Children are told that one brand of clothing is better than sliced bread. Then he or she tells other people that, which makes them believe the same and rush to the store to buy them. This keeps going and going. There is more pressure on teens as time goes on and technology improves. They are also being manipulated more. Kids are now under a lot of pressure not only at school, but because of social media. This is a never-ending process. People don't usually see or know what this is. What do we call it? It's a lot of manipulation. This video has already talked about the beautiful art of political persuasion. We are bombarded with political ads and campaigns all the time. When people talk about a candidate, they usually focus on his or her mistakes, and not on the important things that happen now. When political ads come out, it doesn't matter if a person has the answers to make things better. In order to forget that someone is running for office, we're told to only think about one night 20 years ago when that person drank too much while at college. This is becoming more and more important. 
People who run for office don't even have to do this kind of advertising or manipulation on their own. Smear campaigns can start by anyone who has the money. If we see an ad enough times, our brains will start to believe what we are being told. Here, let's look at what we've learned about manipulation from a different point of view. In this way, we can protect ourselves from it. The fact that you're listening to this video isn't the only reason. You can also learn how to recognize when it's being done to you and how to stop it. It starts with knowledge and awareness. If you know about these tactics and why they are being used, you can protect yourself from them. The commercial wants you to think that puppies and car tires go together, but they don't. The commercial is only trying to manipulate your thinking and make you think that the two things go together, but that's not true at all. There are so many examples of psychological manipulation that there could be a whole series of books written about this alone. There are other ways to manipulate people, but for our purposes, we'll move on to the other one. Now, we're going to talk about a darker way to manipulate people. With this tactic, there is almost always a bad outcome for the target. This tactic is bad for other people, and this video doesn't want you to use it. I think you should stay far away from this kind of manipulation. A manipulator of emotions is the next person we're going to look at. Unlike psychological manipulation, emotional manipulation is almost always bad and does bad things to other people. These are the kinds of things that manipulators look for when they are trying to get what they want out of people they want. Because of their guilt, parents can be tricked into making a decision based on what their kids say. The manipulator will use this guilt for his or her own benefit, no matter what the reason is for the guilt. For example, if a parent had to cancel a trip with a child because of bad weather, then, later, the child brings that up as a reason why that parent should or should not do something. You didn't take me to the record store last Friday, Dad. So, the least you can do for me today is take me to the clothing store. If his or her father is feeling bad about not being able to go to the record store, the child is taking advantage of that. He or she wants the father to buy some clothes. One area where this kind of manipulation is common is with people who have a hard time giving up their drugs. It may seem weird to talk about addiction in a video about manipulation and persuasion, but that is a big part of the world of addiction. The disease is something that everyone who has been affected by it can understand. This isn't just about people who are addicted. It also includes their family, friends, and other people who help them. In fact, People who aren't addicted are more likely to be the victims of emotional manipulation than people who are addicted. Why does this happen? Most addicts need to be smart and know how to get what they want from other people. Otherwise, they might not be able to become addicts. They wouldn't usually have the resources to do this. They need people who are known as enablers to help them. It doesn't matter if these people know it or not. They help addicts keep using any substance they want. There are many ways to help someone who is an addict. You can give money or you can do things like babysit their child so that the addict can go out and use drugs. This is something that most people don't want to help with, but they have to help because they have been put in a situation where they think it's best. One common way an addict will try to get you to do what they want is to make you feel bad about yourself. I have been a part of the life of an addict, and I will use some of what I saw and did as a case study. A very good friend of mine, because of things that were out of his control, became an addict in his adult years. Even though he was an adult at the time, his addiction caused him to go back in time to his teenage years. He began to live his life as if he were still a teenager. So that is what that means. He moved back in with his parents and began to ask them for money. In this example, I show how addicts will use their power to get what they want. As we have seen, guilt is one way that an emotional manipulator will use to get what that manipulator wants. The money he was trying to get so that he could buy drugs was coming from my friend. I'm not talking about a few dollars here and there. I'm talking about a lot more. When he was taking drugs every day, he was spending somewhere from $100 to $250 each day. Even though he had money, it wasn't enough to cover these costs. So, he went to his mother and asked for money. First, she could say no. Then he started to use guilt as a way to get people to do things. In order to make them look bad, he used mistakes that they had made. They were things from his past that bothered him most. He was able to figure out which things from his past bothered his mother the most. In no time, he had turned his mom into a total helper, which led to her emotional downfall. He didn't mean to hurt his mother. Addicts think in a different way from everyone else. For him, it was just what he thought was best for him. Even though he didn't want to hurt her, that's what he did. There were times when things didn't go well for him as an adult. He would tell her about when he was younger. Because his father wasn't the best dad, he brought that up. His mother, on the other hand, was a great mom, but she felt partly to blame and guilty for what he had to go through from his dad. With her, he didn't hold back. 
she would jump at his words. He played the emotional manipulation card well, and because of this, he was able to get an enabler. This person helped him keep his addiction going for a very long time. One of the best things that an emotional manipulator can use to get someone else to do what they want is to show them love. This is just as powerful as fear. Most people think this kind of manipulation is the most harmful. It's taller than blackmail and other small-minded ways. When you love someone, you can make them do things that are bad for them. It took some time for him to get his life back. He eventually gave up drugs, but he and his mother are now using what time they have to make up for what they did. Relationships with other people can also be manipulated in this way. 2. One example is a bad marriage. There is usually one person who manipulates the other and tries to get what he or she wants. This is a very one-sided relationship in which one person lives only to make the other happy. They keep taking until there is nothing left. He or she will do whatever it takes to keep this going. There is, of course, almost always a lot of damage done to one of them. This not only leads to divorce, but it can also lead to a lot more bad things. It could lead to one of them being killed for the rest of their lives. Now, let's look at a place where both psychological and emotional manipulation can happen at the same time. We've all heard of cults, but what do we know about them and the people who are in them? In general, many people don't know what cults are or how they hurt people. There are a lot of myths about cults and people who used to be in them aren't always portrayed the way they should be. It's still true that some people manipulate their followers with all the tools at their disposal. Cults and cult leaders are two of the best examples. Some myths about cults are, there are some here. If they want to leave their cult, they can. Only people who are stupid or don't want to fight join cults. Cults are based on religion, so they are called that. Cults are weird, and their members are usually antisocial and don't fit in with other people. They're just a few. Here we look at the truth and how manipulation helps the cult leader control people. A few years ago, I learned about Jim Jones, the leader of a cult. He led over 900 followers, many of them children, to kill themselves. Because not everyone drank it, some people were shot. They were the people who didn't want to drink poison because they wanted to live, not die. What happened to them in the first place, and how did they get there? It's very complicated and could be the subject of a whole series of books, too. These are the main points. Jones was very charismatic and smart. In that time and place, he was able to figure out what people wanted and needed at the time and where they were living. Because he could connect with the people who would follow him, he made them believe that he would lead them to better lives. Through manipulation and persuasion, he got them to do what he said. There were some things that he was honest about and some things that he wasn't. Before, the cult wasn't like it was at the end. As with any good manipulator, he had to build up his power slowly and show a lot of patience. They believed him to be the best for their lives and that it was in their best interest to follow him. He then took more control of them. The members were almost held prisoner by the end. They had put all of their money, emotions, and thoughts into the cult and now were stuck. Then Jones became dark and his mental health went down a lot. With him, he was able to get them all. That there is no way anyone could hurt a child, especially our own. We say that to each other. At that point, there was no way for them to do anything. The poison or the bullet. A terrible truth. But this is a real example of how a manipulator can gain power and how that power can lead to a lot of damage. Now that we've looked at the dark side of persuasion, let's go back to the bright side. Think about this. The first step in persuasion and manipulation is to get people to believe you. First, you need to figure out what you want. Make your target feel like he or she needs or wants the same thing that you do. There should be some way for the person you want to get them to do what you want them to do. You need to make it interesting. Not everything has to be a lie. This is very important in the workplace. Most of the time, there isn't anything you can do at work that won't also help someone else. 2. Use this in your favor. If you are truly smart and can read and understand people, you might be able to figure out why that person would go along with your wishes. And those reasons are real. When you do this, you won't have to go to the dark place where people manipulate each other. Because you and the other person will both benefit, you can easily get them to agree with your idea of a deal. There is a good word to remember. This means to bring people together. As long as you can get someone to make a decision without lying, hurting them, or being dishonest, you are a master of persuasion. There are different ways to manipulate things. Some people use a lot of different ways to get total or a lot of control over the people they manipulate. Most of the time, manipulators are on the lookout for certain types of people to prey on because they want to be able to manipulate their victims quickly. This is why they do it this way they keep an eye out for people's weak points and use them to get back at them. Most of the time, their victims are either naive, kind, or have low self-esteem. 
Here are some of the most common ways that manipulators use. Gaslighting. There are three ways to manipulate people in this style. It didn't happen. You are out of your mind, and it's your imagination. Some experts think this may be one of the most dangerous ways to manipulate someone because it tries to make them disorganize and lose their sense of reality, so they don't know what is real. When someone is tricked by this method, he loses touch with reality and can no longer trust himself. They don't want to call out the person who is manipulating them, which makes things even worse. Projection People who use this kind of manipulation blame someone else for everything that goes wrong around them. This is something that most people do, but narcissists and psychopaths do it more often than most people, which makes sense. A defense tactic is used here, which means the manipulator shifts the blame for wrongdoing and negative attitudes away from himself. Instead, he or she points the finger at someone else. Generalizations This happens when someone intentionally misunderstands another person for a reason. There are times when siblings, for example, don't think about how their actions will affect them in the long run. Even though you haven't said anything like that, this sibling says that you called your parents wicked because you said that you didn't like a big decision they were making for you. There are times where you wonder what is going on and start to think your brother or sister didn't understand what you said. The truth is that this kind of person knows their victims very well, but they choose to tell a different story. In fact, this is very common with people who don't have a lot of intelligence because they are lazy when it comes to using their minds. They would rather make hasty generalizations about what a person says than make a critical assessment of the words of another person. These people usually come to conclusions and make statements that are not in line with the thoughts and words of their victims. They don't try to look at things from a different angle to see where their victims are coming from or think about the reasons why they said what they said. It's time to move the goalposts. There is a common logical fallacy called moving the goalposts, and sociopaths and abusive narcissists use it all the time to get what they want. They make sure they always have a reason to complain about their victims, but not because they don't like how their victims act or say things. It doesn't matter if the victim has found every possible reason to back up their actions, validate their words, or even done things to meet their request. They are still not satisfied, most of the time. They raise their standards or change their terms, or they ask for more proof. Changing the subject. This may look like a good thing to do, but it is not. One way manipulators do this is to change the subject of a conversation, which is a way to get away from being held accountable for what they say or do. This is also common with narcissists, because they don't want to think about anything that makes them feel like they have to do anything. To avoid this, they come up with ways to change the subject in a way that benefits them. People can let this kind of manipulation go on for as long as possible if they don't stop it. In situations like this, it's hard to have important talks when the manipulator is around. Name calling. This is a way to attack the victim's personality by calling him bad names. A lot of people think this is normal because they've grown used to it from being called names by bullies in school to being called names by their parents or friends or partners. It's not. And it's as bad as other manipulative techniques. People use this kind of manipulation all over the place, even in politics. It even goes as far as the presidential race. Devaluation There are many people who show love to you but always say bad or terrible things about the last person who was in your place. Narcissistic abusers do this all the time, and this is how they do it. The narcissist will eventually treat the new partner the same way that he treated the ex. This means that the new partner is going to find out why the ex was such a terrible partner because the narcissist will eventually do the same thing to him. If you're looking for this kind of person, you can also look for them in a business setting, making jokes that aren't nice. Sometimes, you don't like the jokes that someone else makes. Is your sense of humor the problem? You may not think that way, but you will be told. Maybe the main problem is that the joke was made for a reason that doesn't make sense. There are people who enjoy making nasty comments about other people. As a joke, they might say these things so that they don't have to worry about getting in trouble for doing so. This way, they can say bad things without having to say sorry for them. There is no way to say anything because they act like they aren't paying attention to you. When you try to respond, you are seen as having a bad sense of humor, so you are not able to say anything. Manipulation techniques that aren't as common A few manipulation techniques are used that aren't used very often, but they have been proven to be effective if they're done right. Let's look at some of them. The home advantage. It can be hard for someone to manipulate you if he doesn't want you to meet with him in a place where it's easy for him to control you. It's what they do. They take you to places where it will be easy for them to keep you as their own because you don't have that advantage. Instead of having you call them, they will prefer to do the calling during a phone call. Because they pay the bills, 
they can keep their control or ownership of the phone. If for any reason you choose to stay on the phone with them, you are called rude and disrespectful for not following phone ethics. Speak first to find out what your strong and weak points are. Marketers use this when they want to sell you something. By asking general questions, they will give you a chance to speak for a while, which will give you time to think. This way, they can figure out your personality, thought process, and attitude. Because of these findings, they can also figure out what you're good at and what you are bad at. It's almost certain that their questions have ulterior motives, and they'll use your answer against you in the future. There are many places where this kind of manipulation can happen, like at work or in your personal life. Making changes to the truth. People often use lies and excuses when they use this method. These people are two-faced, so they can be both good and bad. They come up with ways to blame the victim for getting hurt. To do this, they change the truth or choose only the information that they want to share. As an alternative, the person may choose not to say anything that is very important to them. People who manipulate people like this make things up to get what they want. They are biased, and they may also be prone to misrepresenting things in order to get what they want. Presence more than enough facts and statistics. This is intellectual bully, and some people like to do it, even though they don't know what it is called. This is done by assuming that they know a lot about certain fields or topics of conversation. They make it look like they know the most about certain things. These people, on the other hand, manipulate people by giving people false facts or statistics because they know that their victims don't know much about the subject. If you want to sell something or make money, this is a good idea. It is also common in business and negotiations. People usually use this tactic when they are at social events and when they are fighting with each other. They use the power that comes with being an expert to try to push through with their real goal in a more convincing way because they want to feel smart. Some people don't have any other reason to use this method other than to feel smart, doing a lot of things that make it hard for people to get help. Those manipulators use officialism, processes, laws or bylaws and other things to show off their power and make things more difficult for everyone else. But they also make things more difficult for everyone else. Often, people use this method to put off finding out the facts and truths. In order to hide the flaws and weaknesses of manipulators, this is used. It also helps them to avoid being found out by other people, which is good for them. Negative emotions can be shown by raising their voices. Some manipulators raise their voices when they are talking to other people in order to manipulate them in a very aggressive way. They think that if they can raise their voices and react to things in a bad way, they will be able to get what they want from people and have them do what they want. The way they speak too loudly always comes with strong body language like pacing or gestures that show excitement in order to make their emotions more powerful. Surprises that are bad. This is a way to throw people off their feet and get an advantage over them in a way that isn't real. The more you negotiate, this happens a lot. As part of it, the victim is made to say things that may not be true in some way. Most of the time, the most powerful kind of bad surprises don't show up with any signs or warnings. This way, the victim isn't able to get ready to fight back against what they do. In order to keep the business going, the manipulator then asks you to make some changes. Because you already made promises that you can't keep, this is how it works. Giving very little time to make big decisions is bad, because it can lead to bad decisions. A lot of people use this tactic when they are marketing or negotiating. This is how the manipulator gets the victim to make quick decisions without giving him or her enough time to think about it first. Like in a case like this, the manipulator wants to break the victim's defenses so that he or she will finally agree to their demands. They do this by causing tension and taking control of the victim. Treatment in silence. This is a way for the manipulator to make their victims feel anxious by making them wait. To get what they want, they don't answer calls, respond to messages, or help their victim with anything. What the manipulator wants to do with this technique is make the victim think that they don't know what is going on. This usually works in their favor because they can sit back and take advantage of the silence they have made in order to get things done. Pretended to not know. Manipulators use this method by pretending to be dumb. They make it look like they don't know what their victims want or that they don't know what their victims need. This way, they become both possessive and aggressive, which means that you start to take on their responsibilities and worry about things that you should not. This is a common tactic for kids who want to get adults to do things for them or just to stress them out or make them wait. A lot of people, both young and old, use this method to hide their own selfish interests or to keep secrets from other people. It is also used by adults to not do their jobs. Inspire others by creating a beautiful image. Before you try to manage others, you will need to figure out what your goals are as a leader and as a team. 
It might be hard for people to follow you if you don't set clear goals for yourself. This means that if you don't know the people you want to manage, you might be a figurehead or just a title. This means that people will only respect you because they have to follow your rules, not because they like you as a person. This might not help you get a job as a manager. In order to get the best out of the people you're with, it's important to connect with them as people you care about and want to work with, not people you have to work with. You can learn a lot about the way other people think by talking to them. The things that people think about and how they feel are going to show up in the way you interact with them every day. As part of their work with NLP, experts pay close attention to language and behavior in order to understand what is going on in other people's lives. They also think that by asking the right questions, they can get the best out of people and get them to do their best. Use your perceptions to find new ways to look at the same things. One of the most common ways to manage people, especially in the hospitality industry and with customer service reps, is to put yourself in someone else's shoes. This way, you will be able to appreciate the other person and learn what it's like to be them. Also, if you use your perceptions, you can try to look at things in a different way. An observer might see things through someone else's eyes, or they might try to look at things objectively from both sides to get the whole story. Use others as a guide for how to be better. It's good to be a manager and figure out what everyone is good at and how they do it. Just like the people who started the field of NLP, look around and ask questions. Reach out to people who know a lot about a certain subject and ask them about what happened. Another way to get into their heads is to ask what they are thinking at every step. Do this by making your own model of the process. Then, try it out with your team. It is this way that you will get good results. When you find yourself in difficult situations, Look for useful resources inside of you. A good coach knows that most of the time, his team already has everything they need to do well. In order to be a good manager, the coach must help everyone on his team find these resources. What you should do is make sure they enjoy the feelings of happiness and strength that come from all the times they have won and use them in other situations. Understanding what other people care about. People are always motivated by what they believe in. In order to be a good manager, you need to know what people care about when it comes to their work. This way, you can make sure that they have a good environment for success. Make sure to think about the fact that people often want to work alone, even from their bosses, and try to be respectful of that. Give them this if it will help them do their job better. It's common in NLP for people to be curious about how things work or don't work and to ask why things work or don't work. It's important to work on developing your own curiosity so that you can open yourself up to a world full of endless possibilities. So do that. The fine art of deception. There are a lot of ways people use deception. Sometimes, the deception is self-deception. And at other times, people use it to get money or get private information that should not be shared. Self-deception doesn't just mean lying to yourself. It also means that our minds play tricks on us. It's possible to lie even though you know the truth but you choose not to use the truth and instead lie. People make up their minds that a lie is true without realizing it. There are times when a person does not know they are telling a lie. There are many types of self-deception, such as, for example, a person can lie to himself and even convince himself that what he did was not bad. This is called functional self-deception. They'll try to make a lie into a truth so that it fits them best. A person who lies to themselves over and over again doesn't have to take any risks because they won't see the point of taking a risk no matter how good it would be. That risk is not worth taking for them. Value and believe. This person thinks that the more money something costs, the more valuable it is. At the value level, they think that worthiness is important. If they don't think something is worth getting, they won't. This might make them keep looking for things that are valuable but not very useful to them. They think that the more difficult it is to get, the more valuable it is. This could waste a lot of time trying to get something that wasn't going to help them in any way. It's called self-deception. In this case, someone doesn't take responsibility for anything and instead blames the person who is the closest to them all the time for everything. The other person is always to blame when something doesn't work out the way they want it to. So, they aren't going to have to deal with their problems because they don't even know they exist to begin with. It's also a form of self-deception if you tell people things to make yourself feel better about yourself. You tend to tell small lies when you talk to people until the lies become your truth. Such people lie to others until they also forget what the truth was, which is why they do it. So real that even the truth is a lie. The mind somehow picks up on the dishonesty, so the truth is easy to forget. Another type of deception is when offenders try to fool people in a bad way. Eventually, the scammers will find the people they want to target. They will then trick them into giving up money, getting very private information, 
and even risking the person's own life. All in the name of fraud. Such offenders are criminals who are always being sought out by the law. The victims have to live through a tragedy of loss and deal with getting back what they lost from the people who did it. Sometimes they can get away with it. Some people have mastered the art of deception so they can get people to give up private and confidential information, which can be used for scheming. In order to get what you want, you have to use the art of deception. It is called social engineering manipulation, and it is when people are psychologically tricked into doing or giving up their personal information so that they do or give it up. People do a lot of bad things when they work together. It's easy for people to be tricked into making security mistakes and giving out very important information that could hurt them in the long run. Social engineering attacks happen when people don't pay attention to a lot of important things. An offender will first do his research on the person he wants to hurt. He will get as much information as he can. There may be social security information that the victim doesn't think is very important. This could happen. Afterwards, the offender will try to get to know the victim and gain his trust so that he can either release or share the information with other people who might have hired him. Attacks may go through the following stages. Preparation. An offender gets their target, gets all the information they need to base their attack on, and finds the best strategy or method to carry out the attack. Approach. Making friends with the person you want to hurt, then making up a story so the person can be free with you. A friend of the victim is tricked into giving more information. After all the information is collected, the attack is delivered and there is no way for the attacker to get away. To make sure that the crime doesn't come back to haunt them, the offender covers up any evidence that links him to the crime, making a natural exit as if nothing happened and as if the offender doesn't know anything about the crime. People can make mistakes or be reckless when they use social engineering. This is the most dangerous thing about it. When someone makes a mistake, there is nothing that can stop this attack. The software and operating system are very efficient. It is very hard to predict human errors, which means that there are a lot of things that could go wrong. Social engineering can happen at any time, in any place in the world, as long as there are people around. A list of some of the best and most well-known social engineering attacks is below. It's called social engineering. Baiting is a deliberate act to try and get someone or something to do something. Baiting attacks are when someone makes false promises to make the victim want to be greedy or curious. A person is tricked into going into a trap where their information is stolen or their computer is infected with malware, and they don't know it. The most common way to bait is to use media to spread malware. Putting malware-infected flash drives in places where the victim is likely to find them, like in a mall or a bathroom, is an example of this. The victim can quickly get hold of it. If you want to get someone to try your bait, you need to make it look unique and put a label on it that says what they might be interested in. As soon as the victim picks up the flash and puts it in a computer at home or work, the malware will be installed on the computer. Scareware is a type of software that scares people over and over again with false alarms or fake threats. In this case, the victim is made to think that his computer is infected with malware. This may make them install software that isn't needed by the victim but may be useful to the offender, or even make them install the malware itself without realizing that it's malware. Software that scares people is called deception software fraudware, or something else that fools people. This is one of the most well-known or used shareware programs. When someone is looking at a computer screen, a pop-up banner comes up on their browser that says their computer is infected and may need to be cleaned. This is what the pop-up banner wants you to do. It wants you to install a tool that could be dangerous or be infected with malware. You may also be sent to a site that has infections, and when you get to the site, your computer is infected. A lot of the time, Scareware is sent out in spam mail or as a pop-up banner in the mail. It can also be a very good offer to buy something online at a low price, or it can be very interesting. It will be infected if someone does all or one of the above. Pretexting. The deception here is cleverly made with lies and tricks in it. This is how an offender will try to get the victim to give them private information so that the offender can do something for them. Most of the time, the task includes something that could help the victim to be able to do this. The attacker will first try to get the victim to talk to him or her by impersonating him or her a family member, friend, co-worker, police officer, or any other person who has the power to ask these kinds of questions could pose as them. They will ask questions that are meant to find out who the victim is so that they can get private information about them. As if they were the police, the pretext may ask about a person's social number and then use features to get to all of that person's data. To get the most detailed information that is supposed to be top secret, this scam is used. It could quickly bring someone down, so it's important to be careful about it. 
social number information, bank statements, personal address, personal number, phone recording, and even information that makes a person feel safe could be in the information. With this information in the wrong hands, it is very easy to get rid of it. That's why it's important to be sure of who you are sharing your information with. Social engineering attacks are called phishing. Phishing is one of the most well-known types of attacks. Phishing is when people get mail or text messages that make them feel scared, curious, or rushed. In this phase, the victims are afraid and curious. The offender makes them give up their most private information by clicking on links to dangerous websites or even by going to websites that are infected with malware. An example of this scam is when an online service provider makes the user think that they have broken the rules and need to change their password right away. In order to change the password, one must click on a link that usually takes them to a dangerous website that looks just like the real website or the real legit version of the site. Then, the victim will be able to enter the relevant information and the password. Once this information is put on the website, it is sent and goes right to the person who did it. Since most scam emails are the same or almost the same, and only changed in a few places to make them seem more real and yet sent to everyone. It is very easy for them to be spotted and blocked before they reach a lot of innocent people, so that they are blocked in time. Mail servers should try to find them. They have access to forums where people can share threats. This type of phishing is called spear phishing. In this scam, the attackers target specific people or businesses. They make up messages based on a person's well-known identity or character, the jobs they have at work, and the people the victim knows so that it is more likely to be true. For the attacker, spearfishing takes a lot of time and work. It takes a long time for the attacker to use. This is because it's hard for them to get everything together and apply, but it's also the best way for the attacker to get money. It could happen that someone pretends to be the company's it person and sends emails to a person or a group of people. The email is written just like an it person would and has the same signature as the it person. It is, therefore, very easy for the people who get mail to think it's real because it looks so detailed and real. It might make the recipients change their password by clicking on a link that the offender wants them to click on so they can get the company's information. This is what the email might look like. There are many ways to avoid and stop this kind of scam. In some cases, attackers don't always use the internet to scam. Other scammers will make phone calls to try to get money. What the scammers will do is make an interactive voice response system for a certain company and use it to get money. They will then get people to call the toll-free number. The attackers will get their hands on their information this way if people fall for this trick. Before they make the calls, they will have to give their information to the hackers. Here, attackers will get help from someone on the inside who can get the information for them or even give them advice about different things. This is called quid pro quo, and it's when people pretend to be technical support people. In order to get help with a technical problem, they will call the company and say that they need help. During the phone call, the offender will try to solve problems that don't already exist. They will make the victim do what the offender wants them to do. This kind of scam gives the person who did it money in exchange for the information they will get. Prevention of Social Engineering It is a scam that is meant to make people feel scared or curious so that the attackers can get their hands on their information. In order to avoid these scams, there are things that people can do to be safe. Emails should be taken very seriously. Before you act on them, read analyze, and get to know all the information. The pop-ups, advertisements, and other digital information that comes up on your screen should make you aware of what is going on and what you can do with it. Improving your emotional intelligence is the best way to avoid any kind of manipulation. It is very likely that the attackers will try to play with your emotions. What they want most of all is for you to be afraid, guilty, and stressed out. A person who has a lot of emotional intelligence can't be played this way, so they can't be tricked. Before you get into your account or do anything on the internet, be careful about what's around you. One glance at your computer from the wrong person could give away a lot of your private information. Avoid and don't open emails from people you don't know. If you don't know the sender, you don't have to answer their mail. Even if you know the sender, but the message is suspicious or you don't understand it, it's a good idea to check up on the mail first. To do this, you can call them through their phones or go directly to the server's homepage instead of following the link. It's a good idea to keep in mind that emails get hacked all the time. Even though the source of the email may be real, he may have been hacked and the attackers used his mail to scam you. Multifactor method. An attacker needs to know the user's credentials to get into their account. A person can use the multifactor authentication to protect their account so that even if the system is hacked, their mind is still safe. 
This is how you should always treat the security information in your report. It's very important to be wary of all the deals that seem too good to be true. Attackers know how to play with your mind, and suggestions are very appealing to people who want to be safe. Before you click on an offer link, it's a good idea to think about it. You might be protecting yourself from a huge scam. Check out the offer on Google to see if it's real. Keeping your computer's antivirus software up to date is also a very good idea. Every day, you should download a new antivirus. This should be a normal thing to do. Then, the next thing should be to keep an eye on the computers to make sure they don't have any infections. Assailants are very brave because they will get a person's phone number and make the victim the best deal possible. There is a reason why they are so friendly. They want you to trust them. As a way of getting the offer, they may ask for money from their victims. The money they are asking for is usually worth more than the money the victims are asking for. This is called a fraud. But then, when attackers play psychological games of deception with the victim who is now the social engineer, that's when things get really bad for them. It isn't always money that attackers try to get by manipulating people. Sometimes, the attackers will play a game to get information. Sometimes, your friends manipulate you so that they can get your password from you. How to make people like you There are going to be times in your life when you will find that manipulating people will be useful. While you know that it's important to practice in as many different situations as you can, there are going to be some that you will find manipulation most useful in. Here, we are going to talk about where you can use manipulation skills the best so that you can get ahead and use what you have learned so far to get the most out of your time. People who work in the business world negotiate. During business negotiations, it's easy to see how you want to make sure that you get what you want. Most of the time, getting your way means that you want to make a better deal for your business. Make sure you close these deals and make sure they are in your favor. This means that your company will get most of the things that it wants and that you won't have to deal with many inconveniences in the process. This means that you can try to get better terms on the deals, a better price on the services, or other things during these meetings. If you use your skills at manipulation, you are more likely to get the whole thing to work in your favor. Make sure to use manipulation when you're trying to get a better deal for your business. Negotiations are rarely fair, and there is almost always going to be someone who comes out on top. You want to make sure that you come out on top. This means that you can easily take control of the conversation without them even realizing that you are doing it. They think they will get something good out of it, so they don't fight back. As a result of this, and all of the good things that you can get from this, you should use the manipulation skills that you learn as often as possible when you are working on a business deal. Closing the deal People who work in sales know that it isn't always easy to close sales. It's likely that many people who come into your store are dreaming and looking around, and sometimes they won't be ready to buy anything. Because of this, it can be useful to know how to manipulate people because you can get them to spend money they didn't want to spend. The reason for this is that when you manipulate someone into buying something, it leads to more sales for your business. If you own the company, you know how important this is. The more sales you make and the better your sales strategies, the more likely you are to be respected by your boss and move up the company ladder. If you work in a sales job that is business to business, you know that manipulating people is very important. People who show up for a meeting with you are likely interested in what you have to say, but they may also be looking at other companies at the same time. You need to figure out how to put your business above all the other options that they are looking at. People who know how to manipulate people at any level of sales will be able to close more deals and leave their customers happier. This only means that good things are going to happen to you in the near future. Getting a better deal on things You can also use manipulation from the other side of the point of view if you're the customer. Knowing how to manipulate during this time can be very important to you. When people buy something, they usually want to get a good deal from the salespeople. This means that if you manipulate them and work with them, you can get a better deal. Isn't it better for you to go through and get the best deal if you can? You can just take the price. The best way to manipulate companies is to be good at it. You can easily get them to give you the best deals on services and products. As an example, if you promise them praise and help, for example, you can get them in your hand. They become much more willing to talk to their managers and work out the best deal for you so that you will buy from them. There is always a rush to make a deal happen, especially for salespeople who make money on commission. There is a way that you can manipulate the deal to make it work out in your favor. Being able to live the life that you want. Each person has a dream about the kind of life they want to lead, but the life you have now and the one you want may not always be the same. However, the good thing about manipulating people is that you can use it to get where you want to go. The best way to do this is to learn how to do it. 
People who rent a house usually want to buy their own home at some point. Right now the types of homes that they are most interested in aren't in their price range. There are ways to manipulate people so that you can get a better deal, which could help you get into the home of your dreams faster than you thought. There are many big ticket items that you could buy, like cars. This can work with any of these things. Another way this can work for you is with some of the relationships that you have with other people. If you want to find new friends who will help you live the way you want to live, you might want to work with manipulation. You can also use the art of persuasion to get people to become your friends and spend time with you. This way, you will have the friends you need to live this new way of life. Take this a step further and see if it can help you with some of your most important relationships. It might not be the kind of relationship that you want. You can try some manipulation to see if you can make the right changes to make the relationship better. In order to have more romance, for example, you might spend more time with fancy places or people. Things to do. Have you ever been asked to do something? but you didn't want to. It can be hard to say no politely to things that we don't want to do. All of the time, we'll be signed up for things we don't want to do. Depending on who asks for the favor, you might feel like you have to help them out. This isn't a big deal until you learn how to work with manipulation a little more. You might even find that this is a good place to start when you start to practice your manipulation skills. 2. To bring it up, just say it when things are getting in the way of things that you'd rather not do. If you want to get out of family reunions or other things your family and friends want you to help with, you can use manipulation to get out of them. You can also use it at work. It's possible for your boss to sign you up for a job you don't want. You can manipulate your boss so that they will let you not do the job, or you can get someone else to go and do the job instead. There are many ways that you can manipulate people in order to live the life that you want. Business Negotiations Friendships and relationships can all be made easier with this. You can also get yourself out of the things that you don't want to do. A lot of things can be manipulated, and this can be a great way to make sure that you get the life that you want to live. You need to know how to recognize and fight off manipulation. Aim to find it. The first important thing about manipulation is that you can find it. And to figure out what it is, you need to know the rules of human nature that Robert Greene talks about in his book. People will attack you if they think you're weak. To figure out whether they should attack you or back off, people are trying to see if you're weak. Last, people want to win quickly. Then, they'll think about whether they should attack you or not. Attack them if they think you're going to be easy. Then, if people think they're going to get hurt in the process, they'll back off and look for a less dangerous person. People try to see if you're weak. If they think you're weak, they'll attack you. And that's when you should use a defensive stand as a way to fight back. When you want to figure out if someone is a manipulator, you have to give up the idea that you are weak and that you are naive and that you depend on them because you want to see how they act when they have power. Want to see how they act when they think you have them. You want to make yourself look like a weak victim and see how people react to it and how they react to your weakness. As if you need them. Test them as many times as you can. You want to make yourself look weak so you can see how the person reacts to you because that's when someone really shows who they are. It's a good way to figure out who these people are. First, show that you're weak and see what happens. You want to try them out, but you don't want to become attached to them. This is how it works. Avoid them by making a good name for yourself. The next step is to build a good reputation so that no one can manipulate you. It is what people say about you that makes you famous. For this reason, you need to show that you are not going to be messed with. Send the message. You can do this by taking really bold actions. Because if you're with someone and they start to be late and get comfortable with you, you can break it off. Tell them that they have to stop, that you don't like this, and that you have no tolerance for it. You are telling him that if he does something bad to you, you could dump him right away. You can be sure that he'll do something different if he starts playing again. If he does, he will know that you are not someone to mess with. You want to set the pace right away. If you notice that he's not living up to your standards or having a healthy relationship, then cut him off and move on. If he wants to be cool with you, tell him that you're done. It's important to be willing to find him because that's what people feel when you do. They think you can leave at any time. They show their weakness most of the time. So, by making bold moves like that, you show them that you know they are playing games with you. People thought they were good at fucking with you, but didn't know that they couldn't mess around with you. Do the small thing that makes it look like you're about to do it. This shows him that you aren't afraid. Suppose you're with someone and you want to tell them that you're unhappy with how things are going and that he's trying to guilt trip you into doing things he wants you to do instead of telling him that you're leaving. Speak in a way that shows that you aren't interested in him anymore. Not calling him back and telling him that you won't call him back or not calling him back when he texts you. So you're responding in a very direct way, but you're responding in a very bland way, which is not very interesting. 
the thoughts about you leave. When you text, you don't feel anything. When you text him, there is no uniformity in the way you do it. If you don't keep going, he'll think you're giving up on him. And the guy knows that you are willing to walk away because of what you have done. Now that you've shown that you're no longer interested, the guy will start acting in a different way. Then, you must make it clear that you don't need them. The people who know you must tell them that you have more money than you pay and more money than you have. So that even if you lose them, you'll be fine. This will make them stop doing things like this, so they will. For example, if your friends think that you are going to break up, they will value you more. People will respect you if they think you're about to dump them or that you're giving up on them because they're being stupid. Respectful people won't play these games with you because they know that you're not going to be fucked with. There are a lot of things you need to tell them about what will happen if they mess with you. Your message will be that you are hard to deal with. In order to be like this with yourself, you have to know that people look for easy wins. And if you don't make them work for what they want, they will keep giving you shit because it feels good to put your problems into someone. Tell him a story about how someone did the same thing, and you dumped them. You might say, I remember one time when one guy kept messing up with me, so I stopped going out with him. I told him that we were done because he kept being late to the date, and I thought it was disrespectful. We are done. I dumped him. If someone does something bad to me, I'll dump them, too. In one second, I like you very much. If I think you are disrespecting me or playing a game with me, I will break up with you and move on to someone else. In his mind, he will know that you are not joking around and that you are not a person to fuck with. Then, you can just change the subject. One way to do it. Tell them a story from the past about how you dumped someone who slept with you. Know how you feel when you're with them. It's now the best way to find them is to know how you feel around them. So, you have to pay attention to how you feel when you are around them. Most of the time, they make you feel uncomfortable around them. They also try to put you down. When they say something that makes you feel bad, you think about it for a long time even though you didn't feel it at the time. This means that they try to do it over and over, which is called recurrence. They also want you to do things for them, and they only like you if you do what they want. They don't like you. Today, you are the best person in the world. The next day, they can't believe that you exist in the world. This is how it works. In reality, what they do is make it look like they're on your side while they work against you. They work behind your back, but only when they know you're vulnerable. And they do that when they do. They don't hurt you directly. But they hurt you very well, and they do it for their real goal. When you get to know them, they become very angry when they are confronted or told that they are wrong. When they think they're going to lose an argument or that you're going to win the argument, they get very angry. Because of the way they speak, you can also tell this kind of person wants to manipulate you. As soon as people don't understand what you are saying because you speak too quickly, they will agree to your requests. If they can't understand what you're saying and don't want to look stupid by asking for clarification, there are two possible reasons. Either they don't want to process what you're saying because your energy is too much for them and they don't want to deal with it. Next time you need someone to do something for you, walk up to them and quickly tell them what you want done. Then, walk away. Avoid giving them too long to think about what you said. Make sure you use this method only if you are in a position of power and are giving orders to your subordinates. An important person does not have time to go over each and every one of the things that you do. You want them to be able to move quickly so that they can meet your needs. As you can see, salesmen, especially those who sell cars, seem to like this tactic very much. It's very easy for your customer to get overwhelmed and choose the next car on the list because you talk fast and give them a lot of information. When a salesman does something that might not be in the best interest of a customer, it is in the best interest of him. Dress up well. If you want to make a good impression and get something out of it, you need to dress well. Dress well. No matter what stage of your life you are in, nobody pays attention to people who are dressed in a bad way. The only attention you might get is when people hold their purses tighter when you come near them. A lot of people who have been con say that the con artist looked like a person they could trust based on how they look. He looked like a good person, they say. Looks can tell a lot about how someone is, and clothes play an important role. In order to hear yes more often, buy some nice clothes and shoes. Keep your hair neat. Buy some nice perfume and a nice watch. Having a well-put-together look is a different thing from having a look that shows no effort at all. He will get what he wants from a woman more easily if he is well-groomed and smells good. A man who looks like he came from a hole won't get what he wants from a woman. Remember that you don't have to spend a lot of money to make a good impression. You just have to make it look like you did. Consider this. Males who show up in court well-dressed and clean-shaven are more likely to get lighter sentences than those who don't. It doesn't make sense that if you dress well in court, 
It won't work for you in your everyday life. 2. Scare tactics are used to get people to be afraid. Nobody likes to be caught off guard. Humans have a survival instinct that makes them want to be ready for everything and anything that could hurt them. In the world of marketing and advertising, the fear of the unknown is used every day to get people to buy certain products and services with their money. There is a good chance that a certain thing will go wrong, and you need to convince this person that they need to buy your product or service in order to be ready for this. If people didn't have a fear of the unknown and a desire to live through the unknown, the insurance business wouldn't be around. A scare tactic can also be used if the insurance business has made it this far. You can convince people that they need you for a long list of reasons, too. You can use this tactic if you want to get people to accept a solution you are offering. When it comes to personal or work relationships, this could also work. It all comes down to the context and how you work it. Consistency is a big part of what you need to do. A person who is nice to you but rude to the waiter is not a nice person. In order to improve your manipulation skills, this is something you should always keep in mind. It's important to act the same way with everyone you come into contact with, even if they aren't your target. It is important to stay the same because you want everyone to think you are a nice person. If people have different impressions of you because of behavior mistakes that you have made, the red flags will start to go off in their minds. Red flags are the stop signs that will keep your potential assets and victims from working with you to help you achieve your goals. Stay the same. Everyone should speak the same way. Be the charmer who always says nice things about everyone. When you do this, you'll be able to get more people to like and trust you. Once you do that, you'll have even more people to manipulate. Silence is worth a lot. Silences make most people feel bad. Sometimes, the best thing you can do to get someone to tell you something is to stay quiet. This way, the other person will have to talk to fill the silence, giving you a chance to get as much information as you want. The trick is to make sure that you say enough to make them want to talk more. For example, you can say the last part of every statement they make again so that they keep adding more information to their story. An example is, Robert saw me yesterday. Robert, yes, at the new Chinese restaurant that's just opened down the street. If you want to go to a Chinese restaurant, you're right. That's right. Lunch with a friend. Notice how you have been able to get more information without having to give anything in return. For now, you can keep this going for a while, but you don't want to do too much because then it looks weird. Play nice with each other. This tip is a little bit like tip number six, but it's also a little different. Why? Because, in order to get what you want from people, you must be able to play nice even when you're angry inside. There are people who can push you over the edge even when you're nice. You must be careful to always be positive and start your conversations on a positive note, even when you are close to boiling over. A good way to say this is to say that you want your colleague to do something for you, like correct a report that they've made a mistake on. Rather than telling them that they're a dumb person who mixed up all the numbers, ask them if they sent the right report and if they want to look at it again and send another one. This way, you don't make them feel bad, as you need to be able to keep getting what you want from this person. This is the best way to do it. Replace the old one with a new one that is have you thought about. I don't think this is right. Carry your cross around. Many things you can do will make people think that you're a good and honest person even though you aren't. For example, if you wear a cross necklace or a rosary, People will think you are a good Christian with good morals. Once people think this way about you, they won't be as protective when they're around you, so you can get them to do what you want. A lot of men have found out that the things that you carry with you can affect how you interact with other people. Read, women. These two accessories, even though they aren't really store-bought accessories, help them look more attractive. This is why you'll see some men walking their cute dogs or taking their pretty nieces to social events even though they aren't really interested in them. Most women think a man who has one of these two things is a good person who can be a good father to a real child or a pet. This might not be true, but it has worked for a long time and still does. If you want to use this tip, you don't have to borrow your nieces or nephews. The point is that you can make yourself seem like you are someone else by adding a few things to your personality. Talk about that. Everybody thinks you're smart if you sound smart. Teenage girls use filler words like this all the time, so no one will take you seriously. Listen to great speakers and read books to learn new words. During dinner, you should watch documentaries about important topics so that your conversation doesn't seem like you're out of your depth. People tend to trust people who sound smart, and you need to make sure your smarts earn this trust. The only way to sound smart is not to use big words. In fact, the more ridiculous words you use, the less credible you become. Learn how to be judged by your intellect. Use up all your big words in one night. Next night, you won't have anything left. Make room for the data by putting it away. 
Some people won't believe you unless you have proof to back up your claims. CEO, your boss wants to know how many customers you got through a marketing campaign, not how the campaign worked. If you show them your numbers, they want to know that you are doing a good job at your job. There are, however, a lot of people who don't like numbers and like stories more. If you are giving a speech in front of a group, anecdotes can help you get your point across better. It makes you seem more relatable when you use anecdotes to back up your claims and make them more personal, too. They make your message more relatable and earn the trust of the people who are hearing it. The best way to deal with not having enough stories to tell is to borrow other people's or write your own. If you think outside the box, it's not a sin. Unique but also predictable in a way that is easy to understand. As a manipulator, you want to stand out so that people remember you, but you also want to blend in so that people don't suspect you. In order to achieve this balance, you must make sure that you do things that most people do on a daily basis, too. Use words like cliches, talk about things like the weather, and be more relaxed. This way, you'll be like any other guy, and there will be nothing special about you at all. You will have a lot of time to move forward with your plans, but in the meantime, you need to learn how to act like a normal person. It also helps to learn how to blend in, which gives you the protection of a group of people around you. It's likely that when you're just another guy, but also smart and charming, you'll have a group of people who are like you around you. The people who want to get to you will have a hard time getting to you if you're the person who stands out. Newbies are easy prey. Newcomers are always eager to help and fit in because nobody likes to stand out like a sore thumb. People who are new at their job are the easiest way for you to get what you want. It will not be hard for you to get this new employee to do what you want. But you will have to be careful not to seem overbearing because you want to be able to use this newbie for as long and make them think that you care about them. In the case of the intern, you can have them do anything that you don't like by saying it's for them to learn about the job. To get a good employee, take them out for pizza once a week. You will have a good employee for as long their internship is going to last. I need your help. The way you say something can make a big difference in whether someone does it grudgingly or happily, or not at all. As a boss, your employees know that they have to follow your rules and do what you say. People who say they need help will get better results and be seen as more friendly if they say what they want to do in this way. In the future, when you need more things done for you, this is the kind of reputation you'll want to have when you do it. Never feel like you have to show off your authority all the time. You are the boss. Do not tell them all the time. In fact, if you show that you are in charge but not drunk on power, people will trust you more. Political leaders, on the other hand, are very good at making their constituents think that they are just another friend but with a better office. They'll go to local events and sit down with people to talk and have a cup of tea. This is just a way to make yourself seem more relatable. This is just a trick. A lot of people think that their politician is just a good husband and father who wants to improve their community at the end of a long day. They will only realize that they were lied to after a few years. Everything is in the name. People enjoy the sound of their own names, especially when they come from someone they find attractive or who is better than them in some way. Repeat their name as many times as you can without making things awkward when you first meet them. Makes you look like a nice person and helps you remember their name when you need something from them. Address people by their names at work and in other situations where you're in public. Walk up to your coworkers and say their name before you ask for help. You should get to know your neighbor's names so you can call them by their names, too. You'll be able to count on this friendship to come in handy down the road. At the same time, Make sure that these people know your name so that they know you as instead of just a neighbor or co-worker. When people know you, they are less likely to say no to you. When you say no to Liz, it sounds a lot worse than when you say no to the girl from accounting. In the first case, there's a whole person behind the name. In the other case, there is this boring co-worker that you don't care about at all. Keep track of other people's names and make sure they know yours as well. Conclusion It's not about making people do what you want them to do, but getting them to do it. How can you make people do what you want? The first thing you need to do is figure out what their real wants are and then figure out how to get what you want. This means that it's easier to manipulate someone who is nearby if you're close to him or her. So, this means that romantic partners are the best people to find out how to manipulate people. Right. Make people see and feel like it was their choice if you want to get them to believe you. A lot of people want to manipulate other people for short-term gain. It is, however. The long game that truly shows off the skill of manipulation. There is a time and a place for everything. In the same way that professionals make their skills look easy, you need to make manipulation look easy as well. But it will take time and patience to learn how to do the manipulation tricks. When you're manipulating someone, you need to keep in mind that you should never say what you really want. 
Keep an eye on how you are making them feel and try to manipulate for the best. Finally, the more you know about manipulation, the more difficult it will be for someone to use it against you. Everywhere you look, you'll find someone who manipulates. They include your boss, family, boyfriend or girlfriend, co-workers, the media, and 99.99% of the people who live on this earth. It is only the techniques that vary, and now you can know what they are. The next time someone tries to get you to do something, you'll be able to see it coming a mile away. You can either ignore it or call them out on it.